Rebel Rouser. I'm Alan Voivod, and this is Star Wars 7x7. We're at episode number 1,625, and you know, this weekend, or you know, maybe next weekend, you know, I guess it depends on the year, but this is roughly when we would be seeing a Star Wars movie, if a Star Wars movie was dropping in December, and unfortunately, not this year. So, as a result, I thought it would be... A nice idea to talk about a couple of storylines that take place either proximate to or immediately after The Force Awakens and, you know, give ourselves a little room to play inside that space because that's still where a lot of the mystery is. We have no idea how this whole story is going to shake out with the sequel movies. So you know, let's talk a little bit about what we know about that time period. And in particular, we find out a few things from the Poe Dameron comic book series that was produced by Marvel Comics and I'm saying was because the run has ended and there are two storylines that we haven't covered here on the podcast. One of them is the Legend Found storyline. It's a six issue story arc and we're going to talk about it in just a few minutes and you know not totally explore the story arc or give you the blow by blow recap or anything like that just the highlights basically that pertain to the general interest you know not everybody likes to read star wars comics and that's perfectly fine but there are some story elements that i think any fan might be interested in hearing about and so that's what we're going to focus on this takes place during episodes or <laughs> episodes issues 20 through 25 so it's a six issue story arc and the gist of it is is that and I guess I should say that if you don't want comics spoiled for you, I mean, these came out earlier in 2018. So, you know, if you were going to have them, you know, spoiled for you, like it would have been done <laughs> by now. But uh, the general gist is that we all remember that Leia had been looking for Lorsan Tekka and hoping that he would be able to provide a key to finding Luke Skywalker. Well, in this series, they finally find him. He ends up showing up on Cato Nemoidia. And that's, you know, where the Trade Federation homeworld was or one of the, you know, uh, purse worlds of the Trade Federation as it's referred to. And now the Nemoidians are all about security. They had all these grand vaults during the Trade Federation years and now they use those as security for high paying clients and whatnot. So it turns out Laura Santeca is after something called the Kazareth device. And a Kazareth device, he's not after to steal it, he's actually been trying to get a look at it and petitioning the owner of it to allow him to examine it, and the owner has not been forthcoming. We don't know who the owner is, and that's kind of a tantalizing mystery. And so he decides that he's going to break into the vault at Cato Nemoidia and get a look at the thing. And this thing supposedly was crafted by somebody who was proficient in both the light and the dark side of the Force, and it hints at a time in the history of the Force where instead of the light and the dark being in competition or opposition, that they were actually united, which is kind of a fascinating subject, and for all we know, may even point to a solution in episode nine that for example uh is there a possible uniting of light and dark side that could happen between ray and ben solo that would be kind of fascinating and you would think it would take a a threat larger than either the first order or what remains of the resistance in the new republic to be able to get things rolling in that direction but you know that's a conversation for another day anyway so it turns out that the Resistance, through C-3PO's infamous droid spy network, finds out that Laura Santaga is being held because he's captured in the attempt in the attempt to see this Kazareth device, and so they hatch a plot to go get Laura Santaga, and you know things go well and then horribly awry and then well again as things do. In the midst of everything, there is genuine humor in that Jess Pava, who is one of the pilots who survived The Force Awakens and is subsequently not seen in The Last Jedi, but we presume is out and about helping to recruit people to you know get back in the fight. She is apparently viewed as the great destroyer by all the astromechs because every astromech that works with her seems to get blown up. And so there's a lot of comedy that happens around that. And also a bit of tragedy when one of the astromechs that finally decides to help her out ends up sacrificing itself on her behalf to save her from an incoming missile. So 
a very funny and very bittersweet ending to that story arc. There's also a story arc that you know, gets into the soap opera realm with Snap Wexley, who is, of course, Greg Grunberg in The Force Awakens and who will be coming back for Episode Nine, and his love interest, Kare Kuhn, uh, K-U-N, and she essentially is saying, I'm getting too distracted because our relationship is getting too intense and I want to break it off for a while. And Snap is not happy about that at all. And over the course of events, they decide, yeah, this isn't really working. And so they end up getting married <laughs> at the end of the story arc. But when all of this is going on, Snap Wexley is finding himself distracted in his own right. And so it kind of opens up the discussion as to whether Snap is distracted by what's been going on with Kare and whether that is the cause for him making the mistake of allowing the First Order to find the Resistance base on Dakar in The Force Awakens. That his head wasn't in the game, or at least, you know, Kare's wasn't in the game, and that's why she was saying she wanted to take a break. And then his wasn't in the game because he was all mad about that. And now that they're together again, maybe, you know, they're having both, you know, the same kind of issue. So, anyway, that's that aspect of the storyline. And as I said, more or less near the top, they do find Lor Santeca, and he doesn't know where Luke is, but he asks Leia for a ship and says, hey, you know, I'll go see what I can do, and I'll shoot you coordinates when I have some information for you, so that way we can meet up. And so, presumably, that is what leads to the meeting between Poe Dameron and Lor Santeca at the beginning of The Force Awakens. Other fun things in this particular story arc in the comics include the fact that Leia is apparently in possession of a number of Padme Amidala's gowns. And she says in dialogue during the course of this story arc that she only knows her mother through the things that she owned and stories from people who knew her, which I thought was rather fascinating. And she also muses as part of this ruse that she'd hoped that she would be passing the dresses on to a granddaughter someday. And, of course, you want to go, granddaughter, what, you know, ugh, like... <laughs> And freak out about that. But no, no intimations that there actually is a granddaughter kicking around or anything like that. I don't know. We don't know what Luke and Ben were up to in their years traipsing about the galaxy. Maybe he sowed some wild oats. I don't know. It's possible, but I wouldn't read too much into that. And there are two other little tidbits that I want to share with you as well that tie in to a novel that has previously come out and also potentially to episode nine as well. Before I do that, though, I do want to say that I hope you will consider subscribing to the show so you'll get further updates. We'll talk about the final story arc tomorrow. And I hope you'll also consider supporting this daily dose of Star Wars joy at patreon.com slash SW7X7 and join the community there. Your two last things about this Legend Found story arc. First of all, the Absolution shows up, and that is the Star Destroyer upon which Captain Cardinal from the Phasma novel was initially stationed, and so it was kind of neat to see that ship pop up again, and now it's, you know, in multiple media outlets. And the other thing is that there's this freelance First Order agent, intelligence agent, Captain Tarix, and Tarix is able to get some Lobot-like implants out of his brain thanks to finding Loris on Tekka and basically blackmailing the First Order into doing that for him. And he ends up sending the coordinates to where Loris on Tekka is floating off in space to both the First Order and the Resistance and says, yeah, you know, do whatever, which is sort of a very DJ kind of move, you know, Last Jedi Benicio Del Toro. But, you know, in looking at his non-implant like face as depicted in the comics. I couldn't help but wondering if it was possible that Richard E. Grant could end up being this Terex, you know, cast in episode nine. I think that would be kind of fascinating to see a character jump from the comics to the big screen. You know, it's it's not something that's really happened, or if it has, it's been, you know, very rare and very, you know, minimal in terms of its impact. But it would be kind of cool to see this, you know, freelance operator being involved in the storyline and you know making the jump over to the uh the big screen so that right there my friends is going to do it for today's episode of the show thank you so much for joining me for it as always and may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be
podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2018, Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.